It is a huge pleasure today to welcome Alice Kaplan. Alice is the chair of the French department at Yale, and she is the author of many, many books, um, two of which are among my favorite books about France. I have uh, very uh, worn copies right here. Um, French Lessons, which is her memoir about um, her encounter with the French language and how it changed her life. In Dreaming in French about how coming to Paris for their junior years changed the lives of Jacqueline Kennedy, Susan Sontag, and Angela Davis, three American women. Um, Alice is a, not just an esteemed professor. She was recently named a Sterling Professor at Yale. She's about to head the Whitney Humanities Center in the fall at Yale. Um, but she is just a fantastically sensitive literary um, writer and a pleasure to read on any subject. So Alice, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I feel like it's a great privilege to be part of the faculty of Pandemonium <laughs> University. Certainly, I'll never forget it. <laughs> we're going to give you a chair soon as soon as... <laughs> We've been in business for two weeks, so we're, we're working on our chairs. You're, you're moving very fast. The buzz is incredible. So um, you grew up in um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, a sort of middle class family. How did French enter your life? Um, where did it come from? How did it reach you? It kind of came from outer space. I mean, in my family, the only foreign words I heard were Yiddish words from my grandmother. Um, I and my mother picked up some of those words, but it wasn't a language that we were ever going to learn. And it's kind of amazing to think that my grandparents were born in Lithuania, and so they were new English speakers. But in the assimilationist America of my childhood, that was not on the map, you know, as something culturally interesting. How I got to France, I mean, really, I, I was thrown into the French language when I was 15. I was sent off to boarding school because I was kind of turning, I was in danger of becoming a juvenile delinquent, I think, <laughs> like everybody else in my generation. And so my mother thought that it would be good discipline for me to go to the school in Switzerland. And, you know, I was 15, she put me on the airplane, I remember getting there and, and the guy pointed to my, pointed it and said, where are your bags? And I pointed to my bags and I said, la ba. And it was like, it felt like the first French words I'd ever said. Uh, I was fascinated. You know, I think some kids that age are fascinated by horses or something. It's an age at which, it's an age at which you're kind of beyond learning a language with no accent. Apparently that that deadline is past, you know, maybe age five or six, but it's an age when you really cathect. And I mean, even if I saw a tube of toothpaste with a, with a French name, if it had the word dentifrice on it, I just thought, this is so cool. I couldn't believe it. I, I kind of fetishized everything that was in this other language. I think it was a kind of, it was a liberation for me. I thought I could become another person in this other language, that the world was all there to be remade. And it would allow me to talk to people that I never would have been able to talk to otherwise. So, you know, it was, it was a real privilege to enter this other language world. Do you, I, I should point out just by the way that uh, for everyone who's watching, if you have questions along the way, you can hit participants and then raise hand and we can call on you to ask questions. I, I can't really see everyone who's here, but I see my dear friend Casey who was with me on junior year abroad. And so that's, that's great. Hi, Casey. Um, so do you think it, there was something about French itself? I mean, could it have been Japanese or could it have been Korean? Right. Right. You know, what if you I mean, I do think Americans of my generation, American women, were especially sensitized to French. It was considered the language of fashion and beauty and elegance. And, you know, when I was six years old, Jackie Kennedy arrived at the White House. And that was the name I took in school. We all had to take French names in French class. And so I was Jacqueline. Uh, 
And she was, you know, she was a goddess, really. Uh, and her French identity was very much part of her identity as First Lady. I think we have a we have a tape of her speaking French, don't we? Should we share that? Okay. Yeah, let's share that. Je suis d'origine française. Ma famille est venue ici au XVIIIe siècle. Mais vous parlez un français parfait. J'ai passé un an à Paris, à la Sorbonne et l'école du Louvre. C'est peut-être pour ça. Et quel cours avez-vous suivi à la Sorbonne J'ai suivi des cours de littérature comparée et un cours à sciences politiques. Vous avez un bon souvenir de ce passage en France Ah, le meilleur souvenir. Vous y retournez de temps en temps Oui, de temps en temps, j'y retourne. Comment est-ce que vous avez rencontré John Kennedy Je l'ai rencontré chez des amis communs à Washington. J'habitais là avec mes parents et il était dans le congrès. Et vous avez un enfant, je crois Oui, j'ai une petite fille, Caroline, qui a deux ans et demi. Est-ce que vous lui parlez français un peu Oui, un peu, mais elle peut seulement chanter Frère Jacques maintenant. <rire> et elle continuera à apprendre un peu le français Ah oui, il faut qu'elle apprenne. Est-ce que vous avez beaucoup d'occasion ici de parler français Assez à Washington, oui, où il y a beaucoup de français. Et dans le Massachusetts, où il y a des Canadiens. Ici où nous sommes, oui, en effet, il y a beaucoup de gens qui parlent français. Vous avez accompagné votre mari dans sa campagne électorale Oui, souvent. Qu'est-ce que vous avez pu faire pour lui Je ne fais pas des discours, mais j'aime beaucoup rencontrer des gens, parler avec eux. Voyager avec mon mari, c'est la seule façon où je peux le voir. Est-ce que dans ces rencontres, euh, il vous arrive de parler français Oui, très souvent. Avec des gens surtout d'ici, des Massachusetts. C'est ça. Euh, selon vous, quel est le rôle d'une présidente des États-Unis puisque... Ok, that's good. What do people think? Maybe we could get an, an audience comment. What do you think of Jackie Kennedy's French? Does someone want to weigh in and uh, raise their hand? I think it's hard with all these people to get audience. Ah, I'm getting a, a written. Sounded okay. good, elegant. Okay. Yeah. I have a okay. count nine. Let's let's unmute a count nine. Could you introduce yourself and say where you are in the world? Alberta Conti, uh, East Haven, Connecticut. Hi. Hi. I'm here. I mean, it's so interesting. I have a joke with some of my colleagues at Yale that every French person is a French professor because the first thing the guy does is tell her how good her French is. You know, vous parlez un français parfait. Um, and, you know, one is always being judged. Uh, it's something very peculiar about the French relationship to language that I certainly was sensitive to as an adolescent. Um, she speaks really well. She speaks this kind of, uh, kind of schoolgirl French of the 19, well, she learned it in 1949 on her, on the Smith Junior Abroad program. She does make some mistakes, but she knows exactly how to cover up her mistakes by softening her voice. She's really a pro. Yeah. Um, I guess that brings me to this idea of mistakes. And mistakes are so important for learning a language and not in the way you might think. It's really important to be comfortable and happy with your mistakes. And that's a lesson I had to learn uh, in order to learn French. So I just wanted to read a passage from French lessons about learning to say R, since R is the, the sign of a French speaker with or without an accent. It's often the big sign of an accent. In September, my R is clunky, the one I brought with me from Minnesota. It's like cement overshoes, like wearing wooden clogs in a cathedral. It is like any number of large objects in the world, all of them heavy, all of them out of place, all of them obstacles. Je le heurte. I come up against it like a wall. I didn't realize that my R and my vowels were connected. It all went together. By concentrating too much on the R, I was making it worse because in French, vowels are primary and consonants follow from correct vowels. The first priority is for the mouth to be in the right position to make the vowel sounds. 
lip muscles forward and tighter than in English, the mouth poised and round. Americans speaking French tend to chomp down hard on their consonants and swallow their vowels altogether. So that feeling of coming onto the R like a wall was part of feeling the essence of my American speech patterns in French, feeling them as foreign and awkward. I didn't know at the time how important it was to feel that American R like a big lump in my throat and to be dissatisfied about it. Feeling the lump was the first step, the prerequisite to getting rid of it. It happened over months, but it felt like it happened in one class. I opened my mouth and I opened up. It slid out smooth and plush, a French R. It was the sound my cat makes when she wants to go out between a purr and a meow, a gurgling deep in the throat. It wasn't loud. It didn't interrupt the other sounds. It was smooth and suave. It felt relaxed. It felt normal. I had it. With this R, I could speak French. I wouldn't be screaming my Americanness every time I spoke. R was my passport. So this makes me think, Pamela, of Bradley Cooper for some reason. Ah. Uh, because we have a tape, and actually I discovered this with, with my friend Casey when we were on our junior broad reunion. We listened to this tape of Bradley Cooper very comfortable in French, and I want you to listen, also very comfortable with his mistakes. Let me uh, see if I can call Bradley up. Just give me one okay. second. <laughs> okay. He, um, he's being interviewed on French TV for A Star is Born. And again, the French TV guy interviewing him just cannot believe that he speaks such good French, and he's just in total disbelief. Okay, here we go. Mais comment vous faites pour avoir ce niveau de français euh, J'étudiais à Aix-en-Provence. Euh... Oui, alors ça oui, ça je le savais, mais, mais ouais. c'était quand Ah, c'était longtemps, hein Ben oui. Ouh là là. Mais, comment, mais alors comment vous gardez euh, ce, ce je, français euh, J'habite ici à Paris, hein, j'ai passé le mois d'août. Euh, L'adresse, c'est... Non, je... je... <rire> <rire> mais vous prenez des cours euh, Pas encore, mais euh, j'ai fait mes études pendant euh, six mois là-bas. Euh, enfin, vous me mettez six mois en Espagne, je ne vais pas revenir ouais, à parler espagnol. Je ne sais pas pourquoi, hein. euh, peut-être j'ai un... <rire> J'ai pas inquiété à faire des défauts, hein. tu sais, je peux communiquer, hein. je sais que mon grand-mère c'est débile, mais je, je veux communiquer, et c'est pourquoi je, je, je fais de la répétition toujours. Je parle français avec quelqu'un qui va me parler euh, ensemble tout, tout le temps. Il y a beaucoup de gens euh, aux états unis qui parlent français un peu... Ah, On n'en a jamais reçu, hein. <rire> jamais, 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 jamais. Ah oui, <rire> jamais. Ok, we can stop ouais, ouais, ouais. now. Mais comment vous faites pour avoir ce niveau de français uh, I mean... The, the insult of Americans, you know, it's such a projection of the French who have so much trouble speaking English. Anyway, let's not but, go there. But it's also, um, there's a special pleasure or surprise in um, discovering that, some, that someone who is familiar to you, a celebrity, speaks a, another language. It's like they have a whole world in their head that you didn't know about. That's so true, that's so true. And you know, you can go on YouTube and you find all these people speaking French. John Kerry speaks perfect, perfect French. In fact, he got a lot of trouble for it when he was running for president. And he actually has French family in Brittany and so on. Uh, Mitch Romney speaks French because he was a missionary in France. So, I mean, it's a really great parlor game during your confinement to see how many Americans you can find on YouTube. Um, you know, Bradley Cooper says my, my grammar was débile, using that great sort of, it's a colloquial word, my grammar was débile, but, you know, he doesn't bother him. He just goes. He has complete confidence in his, in his speech, and I, I think he's a great role model as a teacher. So what's it like for you? You spent so long, I love that passage about you learning to sort of conquer the French R, which is something that I have yet to do. <laughs> I'm and, not uh, once, you, once you had it, you, ha you had Frenchness in you. Um, and then, you're, and then when, how, what's it like to be around French people, feeling that you have this special skill, but then you're confronted with the people who are natives at it. You know, how, how are you treated as a sort of student of French? Huh. 
Well, it was what I was, what, what we joke about with the colleagues, you know, the non-native speakers, uh, that, you know, we're always, there's always going to be, for example, I went to the doctor. I went to the doctor. It was last year I was in Paris. And, and the doctor spent the whole time talking about my French and where I learned it and so on. I mean, I couldn't even get her to concentrate on the problem I was having. So I, I think that, you know, there is the French themselves are hyper aware of their language. When I go to Algeria, uh, where I've been doing some work lately, the relationship to language is so much more relaxed. You just kind of, you don't worry about it. And I think that's good. Because everybody in Algeria, um, they have, they're dealing with several languages. They're dealing with dialectical Arabic, they're dealing with classical Arabic, they're dealing with Berber. You know, most people don't have the luxury of so-called being at home in one language, if people in colonial situations. Um, I think that we're kind of naive in a way. People in India, they're dealing with a hundred languages. So, so once you had this, um, this experience in high school, and um, how did you decide that this, this kind of fascination of yours was going to become your profession, your career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was kind of automatic. You know, I never considered anything else. It was, I just followed it. It was a love that I followed. I had fallen in love. And did that end up making you, uh, we have some questions coming up, so I'll switch those. Okay. But I was just going to ask, when you then came back to Minneapolis, to yeah. kind of, you know, provincial American town, and you yeah. came back as this girl with Frenchness in her, <laughs> in her brain, in the way, you know, you I mean, yeah, you know, I had my little toothpaste. There was still some toothpaste in my French toothpaste tube. I was using it very slowly. I was very restless, but I got to say about Minneapolis provincial town, it's one of the most francophile towns in the country. I mean, the Alliance Francaise in Minnesota is really important. They've got all these bilingual schools. They have a Concordia language camp. So I was not, I was far from being the only one with this passion. So that's really interesting because once you become alert to a language, you suddenly find these new uses for it and new people to talk to with the language. Yeah. Even my, yeah. my husband it, um, speaks d fluent Dutch because he happened to, his dad happened to have a job in Holland when he was young. And you would think it's a tiny country, it's a tiny language, but he finds uses for it all the time, whether he's talking about yeah. you know, climate change because the Dutch are kind of managing water or whatever. So it's, it's amazing what you start to notice once you can hear. Um, and, and in fact, when you know another language that you love, you can hear it across the room. I mean, if I'm in a, if I'm in a restaurant and there are people really far away, I, I know almost, almost without hearing them that they're speaking French. That's such a huge question. I could send you for some, to some bibliography about terroir, which is something scholars are, as you know, super interested in right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've, you know, a good place to start is a Tour de la France par deux enfants, where these children after the Franco-Prussian War have to travel all through the country. It has, it's a children's book that was used for years. It has every cliche, but also kind of every received idea about every region. I think it's a lot of fun. It's been published in a facsimile. Yeah. Is there another question? Yes, um, there is AAA Jesse. A quick question. Can you say where you are? AAA mm -hmm. Jesse, are you there? They need to put their audio on. AAA Jesse. Okay, I think. Uh, okay, you know what? This the last question of Harley reminds me of where we're going at the end of this because there isn't just geography. There also there's also social class. Um, should I move on maybe to to talk about teaching I think that's, French? That's a great idea. Yeah, because when you teach French, you don't just teach the language as some kind of neutral scientific object you're really teaching a culture. And I learned to teach French from a very great professor named Pierre Capretz. He invented a language method. It actually comes out of the GI Bill. It was designed for, you know, Yale kids coming home from the army. 
and then it was uh, turned into a PBS series of tapes. Um, I thought I would read a very small passage from French Lessons where now I'm a teacher and I'm trying to re-experience my own learning through the students and I'm trying to teach a specific sound in French that gives Americans a lot of trouble, which is the U sound. Occasionally I divide our bodies in half, our left side speaking English, our right side speaking French so we can feel the difference in our posture, our hands, our muscles, our English side slouches while our French side is crisp and pointed. In English, we gesture downwards with one hand. In French, the entire arm is in a constant upward movement. With our French side, we shake imaginary dirt from our hand with a repeated flick of the wrist to show we are impressed, scandalized, amused. This is interesting to be double like this with them and funny enough for comfort. Also from Pierre Capretz, I learned to teach tricks that no one ever taught me for making French sounds. For the R, gargling with mouthwash to feel the vibration in your throat. This tells you where the French R is until finally you can do it without the aid. Making the U sound, the U in tu or fondu or bu, that most French of French sounds is a three part pedagogy. First, you say O oh, with your mouth in a perfect round, as though you were going to peck someone on the cheek. Then E with your mouth stretched out in a horizontal smile like a trout or a wide pumpkin. Then a combination of the two. With your mouth in the shape of a perfect O, oh, you say U, uh, you say E. <laughs> the sound U uh, comes out. This works well. So, Thinking about Pierre Capretz, I mean, one of the things we're faced with now in our department is that his language teaching method, which was so wonderful, it's so efficient in teaching people French, it's now culturally way out of date. And we can measure, you know, all the things that we didn't understand about languages, all the links between French and a kind of upper class society that were assumed to be part of learning French. Do you want to play a little bit of French in Action, Lesson 23? Uh, sure, just give me one second. Okay. So take a look and see if you can hear things that really wouldn't fly today or just seem to belong to another time. Okay. These people speak French. In this course, everybody speaks French. Commençons par mes parents. Don't be concerned if you can't understand what they say at first. Voilà mon père et ma mère. Listen, watch, and get involved. Voilà. Pretty soon you will figure out what's going on and be able to say a few things in French yourself. <laughs> Robert has been invited to dinner at the Courtois and he tries to convince Mireille to get herself invited too. Mireille doesn't commit herself and Robert spends the next 48 hours wondering if she'll be there. He then becomes hopelessly lost trying to get to the Courtois apartment. Le jardin du Luxembourg. Robert et Marie-Love sont assis sur un banc. Mais qu'est-ce que vous faites là tous les deux On parle. Mais qu'est-ce que vous avez Vous avez l'air bizarre. Nous on a l'air bizarre Bizarre, bizarre. J'ai téléphoné au Courtois tout à l'heure. Ah oui D'abord, je suis tombé sur une dame avec un accent bizarre que je ne comprenais pas très bien. Ah, ça devait être Conception, leur bonne. Elle est portugaise, c'est une perle. C'est une excellente cuisinière. Elle fait remarquablement bien la cuisine. Marano aussi, d'ailleurs. J'ai retéléphoné un peu plus tard. Là, j'ai eu Madame Courtois. Et j'ai aussi du mal à la comprendre. Pourtant, elle n'a pas l'accent portugais, que je sache. Non, mais oulala, ce qu'elle parle vite et qu'elle est bavarde. Ah, ça, c'est vrai, elle parle beaucoup. Mais enfin, quand son mari est là, c'est lui qui parle. Elle, elle ne dit rien. Alors, quand... OK. <laughs> so, we, we didn't get... The idea of, of Frenchness as this, like, act, act, as an entry point to this bourgeois world where everyone, we are always sort of beautiful and in the Jardin Luxembourg. 
right, or sitting in this apartment, uh, you know, and the, and the thing that really shocked me was the put down of the Portuguese accent, because there used to be such a uniform idea of how you should speak French, you know, an, an accent was not okay, an accent was, you know, whether it was a Quebec accent or an African accent. Now we consider all those accents part of the richness of the language. So, you know, when Robert says, oh, elle a un accent bizarre about the Portuguese maid, Concepcion, I mean, you can't teach that now. That just doesn't cut it anymore. We have a comment from uh, Simon, Simon Cooper, your own. I think that um, in some ways the hegemony, to use that awful word, the hegemony of English has meant that people don't quite feel the need that they used to feel. They feel they can go to France and everyone will speak English and it'll be okay. There's an assumption. Um, you know, little things, for example, one of my pet peeves is they've stopped giving the advanced placement exam in literature. You can take an advanced placement exam, but it's just for language. It means you don't have all these classes of high school students reading Camus, The Stranger, and Balzac's Le Père Goriot. So the sense of France as this place that has this whole literary heritage to offer is, you know, faded. Yeah, I mean, to, to keep French going, the French government has actually done miraculously. They've started all these French lycées and French schools and bilingual schools and international baccalaureate schools in the United States. You can go to school in French now in Minneapolis or Brooklyn. And I think that is the best investment they could possibly make. You know, I, I we're going to run out of time soon, but I wanted to make sure that we saw the very last tape. What I put on, on our tape is um, a scene from a movie, 2004, called L'Esquive. Has anyone seen it? No, it's by Abdelatif Keshish, and it's called L'Esquive, which means, I guess, the dodge or the workaround. It's about a bunch of kids in the suburbs of, you know, the poor suburbs of Paris. Their teacher, who's very ambitious and intellectual, is teaching them to put on the Marivaux play, the game of love and chance, le jeu de l'amour et du hasard. And so she's teaching these kids, it's a play about aristocrats and uh, servants who, who switch roles. And she's teaching these kids in the suburbs to switch roles and play in this play and you know play fancy language. But the whole movie is filmed with the algo of the suburbs. So I want you to contrast the French in this clip with the French you just heard in French in action. It's, it's pretty astonishing. <laughs> so what's going on is there's a scene between a servant and the, the, the mistress, the aristocratic, you know, the, the girl named Lydia who's wearing the fancy 18th century dress. And she's really mad at the, at the other girl who's playing her servant because she feels like the other girl is being uppity and she's not acting like a servant. And she keeps saying, c'est moi la bourgeon histoire. And she uses this word bourge which means, you know, in the slang, it means bourgeois. But of course, this is a world of aristocracy. But in the language of the suburbs, faire la bourge means acting like, you know, an uppity, upper-class person. So it's full of argot, and it's super, super rich and interesting. And one of the things I'm dreaming about right now, and I'd, I'd love to get feedback from this group, how would you redesign a French method that would include the world portrayed in that film? Something that's really important to me. Could you do a French method that wasn't just filmed in the Luxembourg Gardens, that was filmed in Algiers and in Dakar and in Montreal and in Saint-Denis? Well, what do you do in your classes now? I mean, what, how do you... Well, you know, I, I'm teaching literature now. I'm, I've kind of, actually, I've kind of aged out of language teaching. I think uh, language teaching requires a specific kind of energy. It's a really 
really hard and noble thing to do. And, you know, the graduate students, for example, who are teaching sections of French in action, they're just introducing all sorts of supplementary material and they're opening up the world to their students through their supplementary material songs and their all kinds of things. What is somebody saying, Paul, Polly Lyman from North Carolina Museum? Oops, I've lost the, I'm losing the threads of conversation. What did Polly Lyman say? Can you speak? Um, I don't think she, Polly, if you, mm -hmm. have, if you want to speak, you can put your hand up. Um, and we have a, we have I'm a seeing comment. one little string of words and then it goes away and I see another. Um, yeah. We have uh, Hank. Hank, would you like to uh, ask your question? Yes, I would. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Hank. Okay. Hi. Uh, I went to a college and high school in the 50s. And the study of language uh, was so steeped in the grammar of the language and yeah, not the nuances yeah. that you teach and you feel today. And I was turned off to language because it was graded on if you, how you could conjugate a verb mm. rather than on speaking or any of the things you've enumerated. I am so pleased with the way you present language and the nuances of region and people. So it's just, a, it's just a, an idle comment, but I have a reason to want to speak French and uh, they are my grandchildren who are very oh, close wow. to me and very close to Pamela. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yeah. Whoops, I just lost your voice. Sorry, sorry I just accidentally muted my dad. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Hank. I can't. So nice, that. so nice to meet you, Hank. I mean, I do think in there at all. <laughs> right. I do think that a lot of people were really turned off by having to learn just the grammar because the language was not a living thing for them, and that was what was so great about French in action. It was like you were seeing people in situation, doing things, living, falling in love. But we still have to go further. You know, it's never done. Alice, one thing that um, you know famously happens when you learn an, another place in another language is you see the place where you're from in a new light. So you see, yes. you, you become a different kind of American. You're you're become an American. Yeah. You compare America on many different levels to the rest of the world, which yeah. is you know a blessing and a curse, as we all know. So <laughs> how um, I know you're working on a new project, a, a new book where you're kind of explaining America to the French. Right, right. I had this really nice assignment from my, from my French publisher, Gallimard. I usually, my books are translated. And so, you know, I talk about them in French and everything, but I've never written directly in French. So I've written a little book for them. It's a diary of my life since my infamous election party in 2016, where I had 20 people at the house ready to celebrate the victory of Hillary Clinton. And it takes us through. And it was an occasion for me to explain things that, to the French, you know, that are really obvious to us, but to explain them knowing and knowing what they wouldn't know because of knowing France. So explaining the electoral college and um, talking about problems with voter registration. It was really, really fun to do. It was like being Tocqueville, only an American Tocqueville. Do you think the fact that the, the French are now getting better in English, I mean, they're still not great, but compared to where they were 30 years ago, there oh is a years difference. Is that um, changing your experience of France or the French understanding of America, do you think? I mean, we're sort of sad when we get these invitations to colloquia and it says, you may give your paper in English. It's like, you mean I went to all this trouble and now you want me to speak English? But um, yeah, I think it's a huge sea change. And, and some, some of my friends will go to France and if the waiter speaks to them in English, they'll think it's a put down. And I say, it's not a put down. They're as proud of learning English as you are of learning French. So you can appreciate it instead of you know, feeling insulted. But I'm always struck by how, you know, there's a world that opens up to you in France, even if you can get by in English, when you speak French, whether it's reading them all, listening to the news, overhearing conversations, understanding what a sign on the side of a bus says when it moves past. Um, so reading your toothpaste tube. <laughs> your tube of toothpaste. <laughs> so um, if there are any kids in the, we're going to have to. Uh,